to the magnificent mosaic that is America. From Radio Beacon to Radio Beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Help is on the way. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Road Show. Turn up your mind. The presidency is the most powerful office in the world. It's an office that not only tests your judgment, perhaps even more importantly, it's an office that can test your character. Because you not only face moments when you need the courage to exercise the full power of the presidency, you also face moments where you need the wisdom to respect the limits of the power of the office of the presidency. This nation was founded on the principle that there are no kings in America. Each, each of us is equal before the law. No one, no one is above the law, not even the President of the United States. With today's Supreme Court decision on presidential immunity, that fundamentally changed. For all, for all practical purposes, today's decision almost certainly means that there are virtually no limits on what a president can do. This is a fundamentally new principle, and it's a dangerous precedent because the power of the office will no longer be constrained by the law, even including the Supreme Court of the United States. The only limits will be self-imposed by the president alone. This decision today has continued the court's attack in recent years on a wide range of long-established legal principles in our nation, from gutting voting rights and civil rights, to taking away a woman's right to choose, to today's decision, that undermines the rule of law of this nation. Nearly four years ago, my predecessor sent a violent mob to the U.S. Capitol to stop the peaceful transfer of power. We all saw with our own eyes. We sat there and watched it happen that day. Attack on the police, the ransacking of the Capitol, a mob literally hunting down the House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi. Gallows erected to hang the Vice President, Mike Pence. I think it's fair to say it's one of the darkest days in the history of America. Now the man who sent that mob to the U.S. Capitol is facing potential criminal conviction for what happened that day. Huh. And the American people deserve to have an answer in the courts before the upcoming election. The public has a right to know the answer about what happened on January 6th before they asked to vote again this year. Now, because of today's decision, that is highly, highly unlikely. It's a terrible disservice to the people of this nation. So now, now the American people will have to do what the courts should have been willing to do, but will not. The American people have to render a judgment about Donald Trump's behavior. I, you know, it's amazing uh, because Biden has uh, all that power that the Supreme Court just gave to the president of the United States. But Biden has too much respect for the way things are supposed to be. Um, he doesn't uh, dis dis he's not disgusted with, um, you know, the institutions of the law uh, to the point where he, you know, takes Donald Trump out back and, you know, kicks the crap out of him, which, you know, he could do. He could totally do that. You know, as, as of today, um, the commander in chief, which is a core duty of the president of the United States, right, to be commander in chief. It's one of the most awesome ones. It's bigger than vetoing. It's uh, bigger than recognizing a government. It's bigger than the appointment power. And it's almost as big. Well, I think it's bigger than the pardon power. Uh, especially now that those will be for sale. Uh, but the commander in chief, that's one of these are the five core uh, duties of uh, a president, right? And so guess which one's going to be the most abused? Right. And I know this because just two hours before the Supreme Court was saying, uh, you know, that uh, the president of the United States, while he's, uh, you know, exercising his core official duties, can do anything he wants without review, judicial review, without ever, you know, being challenged, without ever meeting the bar of justice, including assassination, uh, political persecution, political prosecution, taking people out back and kicking the crap out of them, you know, all of that, uh, you know, as long as you say, well, I was uh, using my commander in chief powers, right? And he said two hours before the Supreme Court actually released this ruling, Donald Trump said on Truth Social that he wanted to convene military tribunals <laughs> to uh, put on trial Liz Cheney and try her for treason. 
Uh-huh. And now, if that's the case, then you know that Biden could do the same thing to, oh, I don't know, Donald Trump if he wanted to. He could do the same thing to the Supreme Court justices if he wanted to. He could say that they have departed from the constitutional definition of the three branches of government, the co-equal branches of government, the checks and balances that were baked into the cake by the founding fathers and the hypocrisy of them to say cuckoo things, just nutty damn things like, well... If you want to keep domestic uh, violence, you know, uh, domestic abusers from having a gun, then we're going to need to see something like that in early American history, right? Bump stocks in early Americana. This is how they make those decisions, right? They need to see that it was part of the founder's intent. It was part of the founding documents and that, uh, you know, they would never stray from the founders desires hopes and dreams that they would never so how did they come up with this you understand that okay we're, we're going to be taking off the rest of the week uh, for the july 4th celebration i wasn't going to leave until july 4th okay i really wasn't going to but my brain is hurting okay my heart is hurting my soul is hurting i'm almost broken okay i'm almost broken by all this and so uh, I realized today that this will probably be the last 4th of July that we ever get if Donald Trump was to win. Because you all understand that the 4th of July was the celebration that we had when we won our freedom from the King of England. And now the Supreme Court has anointed Donald Trump to be the king. Okay, they have cleared the way for another Republican president. This time they didn't even wait till we voted. They've done this before. Yes, Bush v. Gore. I lived through that too. That was a heartbreaker. Um, but they haven't even waited till people voted. Uh, but they are anointing a king. I don't even think uh, you know January twentieth will be um, anything but either violence on Capitol Hill if Joe Biden wins, take that one to the bank, and if Donald Trump wins, a coronation. It won't be uh, an inaugural. They're not going to inaugurate him. They're going to coronate him, okay? They're going to pledge fealty to the dear leader. It's going to be the most disgusting thing we ever witnessed. I just wanted to say, Randy, the, before being granted immunity, Trump had no problem going out there and saying he's going to be a dictator for a day. Right. Now, after being granted that same immunity, the first thing out of Joe Biden's mouth is nobody's above the law. There couldn't be any more difference between Stark. these two candidates stark it's a stark difference which is what sotomayor uh, you know was uh, writing in her dissent when i you know i'm still uh, making my way through roberts I, I read the dissents first um and reading them will take an emotional toll on you if 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 you have half uh half a heart for this country okay if you if you were half as patriotic as you thought you were reading what they what the the, the sotomayor and the um katanji brown jackson dissent said uh, it will break your heart. It really will rip you into uh, shreds because they're right. They're right. We don't have a president who should ever, ever be above the law. You cannot do criminal acts and claim, I had to. I had to, I had to kill somebody on Fifth Avenue. I had to. They, uh, they were denigrating the, uh, the, the American way of life. So I, as president, was defending our reputation, and I had to kill the person. Do you know what I mean? Can't, uh, I, can't, I can't live in a country like that. I doubt very many of us can. Um, and so this is crunch time, really. This is it. This is, uh, you should absolutely, 100%, celebrate the 4th of July, but celebrate what it actually signifies, what it actually represents. Because it could very well be the last one. Now... You know, Joe Biden could do whatever he could, but he won't because he's got character, because he's decent, and I will take that any day. All things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. I am I'm really angry and I'm scared. And let me start with scared. I, I disagree slightly with Ian because I worry that voters will not fully comprehend 
what the Supreme Court just handed Donald Trump. This trial is not going to occur before the election. Um, and frankly, the lower court sorting out official acts from non-official acts, making sure you can't use any official acts to prove motive, making sure that the evidence of any official acts that would go towards the crime can't be admitted. Um, but, but all of that will happen after, uh, it will all come to rest after November 2nd. And I wish I believed that voters would understand that their power uh, it was taken away. Their freedom was taken away in Dobbs. This is a whole other le level of power grabbing from the people that the court has just done. Now, angry. Uh, the nerve of these guys to talk about being textualist. Oh. Talk about, I mean, the links that Thomas went to to say that for gun regulations, there had to be something about domestic violence right. in the founding document. <laughs> and then they do this. When the entire premise of our country was to make sure there was never a king. The entire premise of why we exist is to give power to the people and not to a president. So I'm angry at these hypocrites. This is the most activist court I have ever seen. And I'm a, stud I'm a student of the law. I've been a lawyer all my adult life. This is an activist court above all activist courts. And the notion that they want to dress themselves up in federalist bullshit that somehow they are not activists and that they are not bending the law to their political will is horse hockey. Right. It's bull crap. It is. It's total uh, uh, unimaginable bull crap. It's it's almost as bad as the Enabling Act uh, during, uh, you know, the uh, rise of the Third Reich. It is. It's almost as uh, as offensive. Uh, you know, uh, I tell you, you know. I, I look at what the Supreme Court gave Donald Trump, and I know that if Adolf was able to just get that, uh, he wouldn't have bothered with the Enabling Act. You know, the Enabling Act, just so you know, you remember, uh, that's the reason why uh, Nazism was in, enshrined in everybody's life in Germany. OK, um, Hitler uh, had an old president. His name was uh, Paul. Yeah, Paul. His name was Paul Hindenburg. Sounds very innocuous, doesn't it? He was like, um, I don't know, 83 uh, when uh, Adolf was, you know, hanging around going, please make me chancellor, please make me chancellor. And he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it. I don't know. I don't know uh, exactly how he twisted arms or, did, you know, uh, I, he kept winning elections and adding more and more in a parliamentary system, adding more and more members of his Nazi party, the Workers Party, you know. Anyway, make a long story, 11-year uh, story short, uh, Hitler uh, actually got the nomination, got the uh, uh, assent from uh, Hindenburg, and Hindenburg made him chancellor. And as soon as he became chancellor, he decided that he was going to disable, uh, you know, the lawmaking portion of the government, the parliament. He was going to supplant them. He was going to be supreme to them. He was going to make the law. He wasn't going to go to them to make law. He was going to, you know, rule by decree. He didn't need uh, them to vote or not vote. So how in the world was he going to get the parliament to pass such a law? You needed two-thirds because it was a constitutional amendment. Uh, the Enabling Act was, I want you to remember this, okay? And so he needed two-thirds. He needed a two-thirds vote from uh, the Houses of Parliament. And so how did he get it? Because he did get it. Well, it wasn't easy. He had to threaten and disappear people. He had to send some of them to camps. You may not know this, but the very first, it wasn't a, a, the very first concentration camp ever built was actually built as a political prisoner camp. It was Dachau. And it was originally built uh, the same way that, oh, I don't know, uh, Donald Trump envisions having, you know, immigration camps. It wasn't a camp for, uh, you know, holding uh, people and, uh, you know, killing them. That came way later. That, the final solution came way, way later. But the first camp was Dachau, and the camp was to put his political rivals in. And he did that. He, he arrested, um, he didn't even arrest them. He just had them disappeared. 81 communists, they were part of parliament. You had 26 democratic socialists who were liberals. Um, he just put them in Dachau, and he made them sit there. And then he intimidated the other members of parliament into giving him a two-thirds vote of whoever remained. That's how the Enabling Act became, uh, uh, that's how it got passed. Once it was passed, 
Hitler was the supreme sayer of all things. He was the law, he was the order, he was the disorder, he was the chaos, he was the tyranny. Whatever he wanted, that's what he was. And everybody started being, oh, I don't know, Lindsey Graham, bootlickers. Everybody started you know, ju- falling all over themselves to please him, to make him happy. And there was no judicial review for anything he was doing, whether it was criminal or not. Well, let's save ourselves all that trouble of persecuting people, intimidating people, putting people in camps. Let's just go straight to the source of what is your job. And uh, the Supreme Court just handed it to him, handed it to him. That's how bad a decision that was yesterday. That's how, because, you know, when we thought they split the baby, meaning that um, Donald Trump would, uh, you know, somehow have official acts and unofficial acts, meaning presidential and then personal or presidential and campaign related, right? That they would separate those two things and they would draw some big bright line between those acts. But no one, no one imagined that they would say, including criminal acts. So just so you know why everybody is just like uh, acting like they just got the, the stuffing kicked out of them or that the breath just went out of democracy, it's because of that. It's because of the idea that Roberts wrote that it could be even a criminal act, but if the president does it, that means it's not illegal, which is what Richard Nixon wanted his entire... This is, what, this is why Fox News is Fox News. It was Roger Ailes and Roger Stone's get even, get even plan so that if a president ever did illegal things ever again, they would have a Supreme Court that granted them a, a complete and total immunity from even a look-see, from even, you know, uh, uh, being uh, looked at to, as a criminal, even being investigated as a criminal. And they even went further. They said that if the president, oh, this is, this is the creepiest one, okay? This is the really scary part. So make sure you're ready to in, in, ingest this. The president is now in charge of the Department of Justice. And the president can use the Department of Justice any way he wants. If the president engages in completely political prosecutions of people he knows to be innocent, like Liz Cheney, okay, and he still uses the entirety of the government to prosecute Liz Cheney for imagined crimes, or real, whatever, but let's say imagined, You can't retaliate against the president for doing anything wrong. It's not even bad. He can do it. He can prosecute his political rivals. He can assassinate his political rivals. The SEAL Team 6 scenario, the answer to it? Yes, immune. That's why everybody's so worked up. Because yesterday was the darkest day. The darkest damn day in the history of democracy. Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. And have these guys come in my office, you know, asking for my vote for confirmation. And I, I've, I've listened to the Republicans. I've listened to the Yale and Harvard graduate Republicans talk about, um, you know, we can't rewrite from the bench we can't do things the founding fathers didn't want us to do. We uh, can't have a court legislating. Look what this court has done out of whole cloth. I mean, the idea that they're acting like somehow a president was chilled from not being able to use their authority and power when they've watched what Donald Trump has done. He wasn't chilled. He couldn't wait to try to rip up the Constitution and, and, and deprive the country from a peaceful transfer of power. He couldn't wait to find false electors and try to do things that have never been contemplated in our country before. He wasn't chilled. He was, let's go for it. And they're using the fact that somebody might be chilled when the evidence of somebody needing to be checked is right in front of them in the indictment they're considering in the case. Yeah. It's crazy. 
and, 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 and that's why I'm saying they're making this stuff up. They they're just making, making it, it up. up. They are. They're making it up. They actually are. That's why, uh, you know, uh, everybody is saying, my God, they just undid, you know, 200 years of precedent here. They just undid 50 years of precedent there. They just undid 40 years of precedent in the, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chevron deference case, right? I just want people to understand what that, that case was where, uh, you know, agencies are now toothless little, you know, things hanging out there in the flotsam and the jetsam of the ethers, you know, the ecosystem. So let's say, let's say you don't get your Social Security check. Who are you going to call now? Right. You see, this is, this is how they destroy uh, the entire uh, checks and balances. The, and every time we marvel at how ingenious the founding fathers were and how we thought they thought of everything, we now find out that there were some holes in it. Some hole, And these holes are now giant gaping canyons with which they intend to walk these garbage trash people through into the government. And for what? Christian nationalism. See, this, this is the, you know, everybody's going, well, why don't we talk about Project 2025? And the answer is because you don't have to talk about it. This is it. This is it. The Chevron deference case was Project 2025's opening salvo. Destroy all agencies, make them toothless wonders, no help to anybody, and let everybody think that the government is not here to help you. And then the people will help, uh, you know, destroy it. You know, the Enabling Act, which was the actual amendment to the German Constitution, the Weimar Constitution, uh, like I said, you know, it needed a two-thirds passage, right? And so people had to be uh, disappeared, people had to be put in camps, people had to be threatened, people had to be intimidated, people had to be told. And the other people were told, like, um, that, you know, they had a Catholic party in the uh, Reichstag. They did. They had a Catholic party. Because it's parliament, right? They had all these different uh, factions. They were told that this was all for the economic benefit of the people and that the churches would be left out of this. And so the only sane vote was to vote for the Enabling Act, okay, uh, and, and to let, let this, uh, it was called the law, it's not really called the Enabling Act, it's called the law to remedy the distress of the people. That's the Enabling Act. And they were told it was an economic uh, piece of legislation, okay, and that it would change the Constitution, but it would benefit the people because the Weimar Republic, see, this is the crazy part for me, for me. This is the part I, I can't really understand yet. You know, the Weimar Republic went through uh, some things, okay? After World War I, they had an enormous amount of war debt due to the Treaty of Versailles, Okay, the Treaty of Versailles, which ended World War One, but didn't really end it, just left it sort of hanging out there, said to the Germans, you did this, you're going to pay for it, you're going to pay for everybody to repair, everybody. And the amount of the war debt crushed the German economy. I mean, really, I, it was all put on the Germans. And so the German Weimar Republic decided, well, we'll just print more money <laughs> and pay the debt. And that caused hyperinflation, okay? That was the, you know, you hear me every once in a while reference how you needed a wheelbarrow full of uh, Deutschmarks to buy a loaf of bread. That's the truth. That's how bad the economy was, okay? But that's not, uh, that's not exactly when, uh, you know, everything started to change. That's not when, uh, you know, things became, uh, you know, Nazi. It was just uh, uh, an opening salvo. It was a way to talk to people about there must be a better way. <laughs> Well, there is. It's called fascism, you know. Um, but we didn't have, I mean, we had, a, uh, we had a recession under Donald Trump, that's for sure. We lost a, a, a crap load of jobs, like 15 million jobs or 14 million jobs or some ridiculous number of jobs. You know, people were idled. People were, were pushed aside. Nobody could go. No, you know, some people figured out that they could work from home. Other people, you know, you, if you cut meat, you can't do it from home. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, so, but we, we don't have that now. What do we have? We have 3% inflation and everybody's wigging out? See, that's what's so hard for me to, to understand. Like, why will you accept uh, white Christian nationalism as, as a replacement for a democratic republic? Like, why would you do that? You know you don't get to vote, right? You understand that? You know that the court becomes the arbiter of everything, like the mullahs in Iran, okay? 
And you know that the rights that we had had for 50 years, you know, that they took at least one of those away. And once they start taking rights away, and, you know, we've never done that before using our Constitution. We have only ever used our Constitution to increase rights for more and more classes of people, like women, right to vote, African Americans, right to vote, like that. We have never used our constitution to take rights away, but we're doing that now. We're doing that now. We just, we just, we lived through the last two years, and um, I, I, I don't see, you know, much going on about uh, people being hysterical on the street about they took away our rights, and you know, see, but this is the, this is the thing that everybody on my side of the aisle will tell you, is that when you take rights away from one group of people, you're taking rights away from everybody because it just bleeds into everybody's life. It just bleeds on and to everybody. So look at what the Supreme Court has already done. They undid the Voting Rights Act a couple of years ago, right? They said, we don't need it anymore. Racism is over. So Section 2 was gone. They got rid of affirmative action. And now even the people that brought that case, the Harvard case about, uh, you know, affirmative action, they realized what a mistake they made by bringing that case. But they did away with affirmative action. Then they came in and they said, okay, no more Roe v. Wade. It's not a guaranteed right. You have to, you know, if you live in Alabama, you're SOL. But if you, you know, if you have money, you could always travel to New York. And if you don't, you're SOL. You know what I mean? And, you know, if you're in Texas, we don't even want you to be able to travel to New York because we thought of that too. And uh, we're not letting you do it because we are the mullahs, right? And so freedom to travel, that's not happening either. And then yesterday they said the president is above the law. And then the day before that or two days before that, they said agencies are not allowed to use their expertise to enforce the laws that Congress passes. So everybody's going to have to what? Start drinking bottled water? You're going to have to grow your own food now? I mean, there's like no safeguards anymore. The Food and Drug Administration's toothless. Right? I mean, the agency's expertise be damned. The the court is now the experts in everything all the time. You see how the rights just keep on being hacked away from you? Clear. This is the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. Trump today uh, on his true social said that uh, you know, the January 6th committee members should be arrested. Then oh. he suggested that there should be military tribunals, specifically with a picture of Liz Cheney. And if you take a look at what the uh, court's decision is today, uh, that, that he would violate the law and the Constitution appears to be okay with them. Yep. Uh, they have created uh, you know, we're, we're three days short of the 248th anniversary of the signing of the uh, of the Declaration of Independence, and they have trashed that today uh, with creating an imperial presidency that our forefathers overturned. Uh, they didn't want a king. I don't want one either. And I think, you know, voters have an opportunity to prevent uh, this guy from becoming the authoritarian leader that he has told us he wants to be. But we also have a problem with this court that we've got to grapple with. How do we address this? The next president probably is going to appoint uh, three justices. Oh, my God. Uh, And so if Mr. Trump is not elected, there'll be some opportunity uh, to get back to the center away from this extremism in the court. They have shown a propensity, this court, to just completely overturn willy-nilly long-standing precedents. Yep. The next court may need to do that to get us back in firmly into the center where we were before these extremists were appointed uh, to our highest court. Yes, Zoe Lofgren uh, nails it. So we need court reform. Uh, that's the thing that we would be voting for. So uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, Joe Biden isn't your cup of tea for a billion reasons. Maybe, uh, you know, he's old. Maybe he's frail. Maybe you think this. Maybe you think that. I don't care anymore, okay? I don't care because the alternative is literally death. The alternative is literally tyranny. It's literally chaos and then tyranny. This is where we have marched 
to. Okay, this is what all the little, you know, uh, uh, slights and ignoring them all, ignoring the overturning of the Voting Rights Act and ignoring the gerrymandering, ignoring the, uh, you know, overturning of Roe for two long years, ignoring the uh, the, the Chevron deference uh, violating 40 years, 40 years of saying, yes, experts are, uh, you know, uh, science guys and weather guys and meteorologists and all that. They are in, uh, you know, uh, the the agencies, okay? They understand, you know, uh, what needs to be done to enforce clean water rules. They know what needs to be done uh, to be, you know, to build resilient bridges, to build tunnels that can withstand, okay, uh, uh, pressure. The Supreme Court thinks they know better. 18,000 court cases, 18,000 court cases over the last 40 years have relied on that Chevron case so that experts could actually offer us their big brains and we would be able to benefit from that. But the Supreme Court says, no, Judge Kazmarek in Amarillo is a better judge of what women need then an OBGYN, then the Food and Drug Administration, then the, the EPA, then the FDA, anybody, anybody's better. Uh, you know, the, any, Alito's better. Judge Kasman. And you know, if Donald Trump becomes president, it's not just the Supreme Court. It's all the lower courts, too. We're going to have a country full of alien cannons, a country full of people who have never tried a case in their lives. Now, being charged with overseeing uh, fraud cases and, and complex, uh, you know, uh, white collar crime cases, RICO cases, all of it, but none of it ever, ever applying to any of the president. And, you know, look at the, the president's garbage people. You know, Rudy Giuliani finally got disbarred today. Why did I think that he was disbarred before? Because his license was suspended, his law license. It had been suspended for lying to legislatures across the country. And because he literally put in harm's way, he literally uh, uh, almost had, you know, uh, uh, two deaths on his hands with uh, Shane Moss and Ruby Freeman, who had to flee their houses for the simple thing of becoming, uh, you know, uh, 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 volunteers, election uh, volunteers to count ballots. And for this, their lives were threatened because Rudy Giuliani decided to say that they were passing around USBs when it was a ginger mint. I mean, so he finally lost his law license today. So that's a garbage human being, okay? That is somebody who has fallen so far from grace just because he threw in with Donald Trump, okay? You've got Manafort also. He's, he's the campaign advisor. Again, that's a guy who went to jail for, uh, you know, colluding. I know you hate the word, but colluding with, the, you know, Russians. Peter Navarro, he was your trade advisor. I don't think you understand that. He's in jail. Steve Bannon is, is, was a Trump advisor. Oh, Steve Bannon was in the White House. He had a gig inside Donald Trump's White House. Until, I don't know, I guess Jared and him didn't get along. I guess uh, they were stepping on each other's ability to thieve and steal. So Bannon ended up doing the low-tech thing, uh, fundraising for a fictitious wall by exploiting and using a wounded warrior named Colfage to be his front guy to gain sympathy, you know, and, and stole a million dollars from his own listener. Anyway, he's not even in jail for any of that because he got a pardon. He's in jail for contempt of Congress. And yesterday he was standing on the lawn of the Danbury Minimum Security Prison with Marjorie Taylor Greene, another trash person. All these garbage humans, they all gravitate to Donald Trump. Why do you think that is? Because they're like Pauly, they're like Silvio, okay? They're low-level mob brains. And they glom on to the boss. Who thinks of the caper? Jimmy! I'm telling you. And you're all going to be genuflecting uh, at the feet of, of, of these garbage human beings. Please, please don't hurt me. Please, please let me keep my house. Please, please don't make me work in the camp. I'll turn in my neighbor. I will. Do you want that? I mean, is that the country that you thought you were defending if you signed up? Is that the country you thought you were living in if you didn't? 
Is that the country you thought I signed up to defend? Because it ain't. I mean, really, how far are we going to let this stupid project go because Joe Biden is 81 years old? Who gives a rat's ass? Hindenburg was 83 years old. That kind of exploitation, is there's nothing new about it. You get some guy with, uh, you know, a big, big, uh, you know, charismatic, uh, speechifying, uh, you know, uh, sort of a talent, and everybody gathers round, gathers round. And then what you get is pure chaos and tyranny and death and war and, oh, my God. And, and, you know, the left... The left, like I said, has gone so far to the left that they're on the right. They have done an exquisite job of turning decent people against Joe Biden. As if what's going on there, because the right wing Likud party over there is doing what they're doing somehow, Joe Biden. That's insane. Because you know what? If you think that right wing Donald Trump, who is a fascist, and right-wing Benjamin Netanyahu aren't going to come up with their own Palestinian solution in the end. You're insane. You're insane. And I don't know what some of these people on the left were thinking when they started down this road. And some of them are still on that road. And it's bad. It's always been bad. It's always been dangerous, especially for minority populations, and it's dangerous for this country to turn decent people against Joe Biden as if Joe Biden is waging war in Gaza. Yes, that one of our, the businesses of the United States is weapons. We actually make them in this country. When you say buy American, what the hell do you think you're talking about? But the president of the United States doesn't sell them. Raytheon sells them and Boeing sells them. And all, all, yes, the Congress has to sign off on the transfer. But that's a far cry from coming up with the solution, which you know what it's going to look like over there. You just do. If the right wing prevails, this world just will fall into complete and utter tyrannical death. It will become the little blue marble that couldn't. I'm, I'm not even like... Uh, I'm not even asking you to believe me. I'm not. I'm. I'm just telling you right now. Wake up. Just. Just. Turn on the light now, and let the little roaches scurry back into their wall. It's like the cicadas, you know. They sleep. They sleep. They sleep in the dark, and then all of a sudden, right? Where did they come from? I'm just begging. I. I. I'm not even asking anymore. I'm just begging. Begging. I don't, I don't care if the guy is on life support, okay? I really don't. And he's so far from that. I mean, that's far down the future. Clear. Mary had a little man. We believe that all men are created equal. The magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. Change has come to America. Believe me. Help is on the way. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Road Show. Turn up your mind. I am proud to go to prison. If this is what it takes to stand up to tyranny, if this is what it takes to stand up to the uh, Garland corrupt criminal DOJ, if this is what it takes to stand up to Nancy Pelosi, if this is what it takes to stand up to Joe Biden. And let's bring in senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky outside that prison in Danbury, Connecticut for more. Aaron, what's the latest there in Danbury? Steve Bannon drove into FCI Danbury just before noon Eastern time to begin serving his four-month sentence for contempt of Congress. Diane, he held a a lengthy uh, bit of court on the lawn just across the street, a smattering of supporters and detractors behind him making all sorts of noise as he said that he had no regrets. In fact, he said he would have been upset with himself if he hadn't defied the subpoena from the January 6th commission that ended up getting him in trouble in the first place. And he called himself a political prisoner despite his conviction in federal court and the failure of multiple appeals, including one just last Friday when the U.S. Supreme Court declined to intervene. 
I mean, <laughs> he's st- she. I don't know who's he's a garbage person, and I think everybody who's ever listened to ten minutes of him knows how garbagey he is, and knows what his end game is. He he wants a Catholic country. That is what Steve Bannon is all about. He wants a Catholic country, hence no contraception, hence no uh, abortion, uh, you know, no law, only the church, right? And that's why he sits there with all these iconic, you know, uh, Celtic crosses behind him. But there's Marjorie Taylor Greene sitting there, okay, in front of a freaking prison, a federal prison, and she is a lawmaker, a lawmaker. And he, uh, she's a congressional a member of Congress, and he's going to federal jail, federal prison, for being in contempt of Congress. He's literally in contempt of her body, her, 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 oh, not, the, not the blonde, bad, butch body, the body in which she takes an oath, Congress. And she goes and joins a garbage, trash human like that as he stands on the lawn of a federal prison about to enter for four months for, for disrespecting the rule of law. I mean, if he didn't do anything, if he has no problem, well, just go testify. Just go, raise your hand and testify. If you don't have any documents that are incriminating, then just hand them over because that's what the subpoena was for, documents and testimony. But no, no, he'd rather go to prison and scream and yell that what we saw happen on January 6th and the fact that he said the day before January 6th that tomorrow all hell is going to break loose, strap in, that he knew that there was going to be violence visited upon his own capital, that people were going to defecate in the hallways, that it was likely that people were going to get hurt if not killed, and they did. And he thought that was fun and entertaining, and he was going to be a big man in his audience, which he stole a million dollars from. But he was going to be a big man in his little world on Rumble by being able to tell everyone he knew violence was coming. Now, how did he know? Because the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters and the, and, and the freaking Alex Jones crowd, they all talked to each other. And everybody knew that there were weapons being brought there. Everybody knew what was right across uh, the Potomac River. Everybody understood, you know, what was about to happen. But they didn't want any law enforcement to protect the, the House members. They didn't want any law enforcement to be protected. They didn't want, I mean, Donald Trump keeps lying about how he asked for the, uh, the, the, the guard to come. You, you remember Christopher, uh, what was his name? Uh, uh, the acting uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, I think his name was Wright. His last name was Wright. He he actually put out a memo saying that, uh, you know, nobody asked for the National Guard. He testified nobody asked for the National Guard. And then he said that if anybody was there, they should be unarmed. They should all be unarmed. I mean, it's a, it's a very sick and twisted story, and they know it. They know what the story is because they actually crafted it. They wrote the story. They executed on the story. They directed the story. They starred in the story. And they're all claiming now that they're innocent. They're just so, they're political prisoners. Political prisoners. You freaking attacked your own capital, you yutz. You schmuck. You piece of crap. Four months. Four months. It's so insane. It's insane. All right, Ron in Buffalo. Yeah, okay, I can hardly hear you for some reason. No, no. Can you hear me all right? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Anyway, do do facts matter at all in this whole case? In other words, who determines what's an official act, and does it matter if it's true or not? In other words, Donald Trump has been saying all along here that he thinks the election is stolen. Now, we know from other information that he, he was, he's lying, but if he really can convince people, then he had the right to disrupt it and, and, uh, and because he's defending the Constitution. Uh, is that correct? Is that right. what this, that, this, yes. this decision means? Yes, it does. It's a sick. It can't peep. So, but there is an the arbiter. There, there, well, you asked me a question, so I'll answer it. You asked me who decides I'm whether sorry. it's an official act or not. And that is why Judge Chutkin, 
who is sitting in the courtroom uh, and is about to have hearings on whether or not what Donald Trump did was an official act or a personal act or an act of a candidate or an act of politics or whatever. She's going to actually have to go through all this. And this is the beauty of it in this weird way, Ron. Okay, this is the silver lining. Judge Chutkin is going to ask Jack Smith to call every single solitary witness that would testify in the trial, in the January 6th trial, because she has to vet them all now and find out if they were operating on uh, presidential, presidentially protected communications or if they were acting as uh, advisors to a candidate. You understand? And so everybody has to be vetted now to see whether or not they were part of an official act of protecting and defending the country or whether they were a part of a political act of overthrowing the results of a free and fair election. So we're going to get to see the entire case before anything well, is actually tried. Would be shown on TV or anything? Or? Oh, hell no. That would, be, uh, that would be right. That would be good. That would be efficacious, as they say. No, it won't be on TV. Federal right. trials are not on TV. Okay, but that so that but how long is this going to take? Well, she she actually has a, a date. I think I forget what it is. I have so many numbers in my head today. Uh, I feel like Biden, but she has a date where she is going to actually have hearings uh, where she's going to ask for. I I doubt the defense will call any witnesses for this, but she's going to ask uh, Jack Smith, the prosecutor, to call all his witnesses and to show all his evidence to her so that she can say whether or not it's protected as an official act or this was political. But, but I mean, what is the criterion for saying it's an official act or, or, or not? Well, if it was to, you know, uh, do something political, if it was to, you know, make him the president, the next president, and he was the candidate, then that's political. But if he was protecting and defending the United States of America, uh, then that's an official but we know that that's not so, what it, just, so, but we so know we that's really not what that. it was because he sat there and let it happen but she has yes. to go through the exercise uh-huh. i see so that that part of it okay uh, is there any chance this will be anywhere underway or or known about before the election yes absolutely yes that will happen before the election okay and if, if the people hear that maybe they'll vote for biden i hope i mean geez. i'm not i'm not hoping i'm begging i'm just saying i i, I don't want I, I i do not want to live in a camp okay i don't i know i know and you're you're pointing out about that thing enabling an access spot on you know i can't believe how smart you actually are <laughs> please stop. i read your no you read your bio i read your bio and if i'm right i, I don't want to get too off right the i have no but, high school i know <laughs> I watched it on TV. All things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. All right, Louise in Georgia. Hi. Hi. Hey. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know what? All the Catholics in the United States need to get together, sign a petition, and send it to the Pope. To have Clarence Thomas as communicated. <laughs> I've known <laughs> I've known Clarence ever since he was like all his life. He oh. was a freshman my senior year in high school. We in Savannah really don't have no respect for him. He sold his mother's house. The lady already lived in the house. He sold her her house and had it remodeled so she can rent live rent free. Live rent free. She already owned the house. <laughs> he, he didn't even have the decency to come to Savannah to his only brother's funeral. Okay. I mean, uh, you know, his son is in trouble, too. And, you know, we don't we don't like to talk about stuff like that because, you know, it's personal. But, you know, his son is is not doing well. His son has a, a little issue with, with drugs and, you know, other things. And Clarence just disowned him, too. And this is the person that um, Harlan Crow paid to put through school. That's the kid. I don't think that's his biological son. I no, think it's, it's not. not. It's his, his sister. Yeah. That's son right. That's right. that he adopted because she embarrassed him by being on welfare. Oh, is that what that was? That's what that was. Oh, that's so sad. That is sad. 
Oh and God. also, um, you know, what Biden is a true Catholic. He represents our Catholic religion because we're not taught to put our foot down on our, somebody's neck. And I really respect him for that. This stupid governor that we have here in Georgia, he's the reason why Mary, uh, Marjorie Green is back in office because he said it was okay for her to, re- to run for re-election. Now, what's going on in Atlanta with, with Fanny, Fanny, it's a disgrace because, first of all, the judge sat there, because they showed it, they televised the hearing, he's sitting there on the bench playing video games. There's no way, no way he should have allowed those questions to go, the line of questions to go through. Because but you know what, Louise, to... even if, the, even if the, the questions were asked and answered the way that they were, what is the crime here? I'm not really sure. Is, if, if Bonnie Willis was having an affair with the defense attorney and they were sharing, you know, uh, prosecutors were sharing with the defense attorney, you know, tactics and, uh, you know, uh, evidence, and that would be a problem. That would be, you know, dishonest. But what, yeah. what? How many of us did? How many of us have gone through our entire professional lives and never met anybody at work that we went out with? Okay, and who cares about who right. you slept with? That's what I'm and saying. With, okay, and with uh, Wade's divorce, who cares about his divorce? See, these should have never been brought up. But that. Um, but this is what they do, and and I'm just telling you, they're not done with attacking the prosecutor. So now, in this Supreme Court decision yesterday, there's this little paragraph that your friend Clarence decided to throw in there. Nobody even brought it up in the hearing. It wasn't a question. It wasn't anything that uh, you know was asked by uh, any of the lawyers. It wasn't anything that was asked by any of the justices. But Clarence Thomas decided to put on the in the decision that he sees no law that is uh, 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 that makes Jack Smith legally appointed as a special counsel. Now, we've That's had special true. counsel, I swear to God, we've had special counsel since Ulysses S. Grant, as far as, you know, uh, as far back as uh, before the Civil War. And now, all of a sudden, Clarence is going to question whether or not Jack Smith is legally uh, allowed to be a special counsel. Now, you know who he wrote that for? He wrote that for Eileen Cannon. That was a you go girl because she is the only judge who has questioned whether or not Jack Smith is legally entitled to be a special prosecutor. So Clarence just gave her exactly what she needed to hang her hat on it and to attack that prosecutor. So this is the M.O. And nothing was really said about um, that defense attorney that was doing that in, in Atlanta. Her husband as an attorney, and he was right there in the courtroom. Well, I know, but, you know, uh, it, it was just a way to attack a prosecutor and slow it all down, okay? Yeah. And then to try to get her removed. But there's no conflict. What's the conflict? I don't know. I don't know. There that's, isn't any. Uh, she's allowed to date uh, whoever uh, she wants. And if, he, right, and, if he, and if he works on her side of the, of the table and he's her legal, uh, you know, uh, advisor, or he's a, a guy who, you know, works with her team, uh, then there's no conflict. That's true. Right. The judge also had worked in Fanny's office and also had contributed to her campaign at one time. It doesn't matter. There's no conflict. She's not right. on trial. He's not, you know, uh, put, he's not, uh, you know, the trier of fact about whether or not she did something illegal because there is no charge of doing anything illegal. It's just a suggestion that she's conflicted. How? Where's the conflict? There isn't one. I, I don't understand the people here in Georgia, especially in Atlanta. They thumb they know that as here in Savannah. But had it been here in Savannah, it would have been a different thing because we would have been down there at that courtroom and we at that courthouse and we would have really protested things like that. But yeah. Atlanta people, they think they're better than we are here in Savannah. <laughs> and they let all of this go they let all of this go by. I, I don't understand it. Well, it makes, and I also it's another it's, thing like I, I said, the uh, way to understand it is that this is part of their tactic and their tactic is to attack the prosecutors, all of them, you know, and, and another, I mean, you see uh, Donald Trump standing there threatening judges, right? I mean, yeah. right. So 
But that's I, the tactic. Thing, All right, I'm thing gonna, I'm gonna, yeah. I mean, is there any, anything else? Yeah, I can't understand why I, you know, what I'm 79 years old. Uh, I can't understand why abortion has become such a big issue. It isn't. <laughs> It isn't. It's been with us for 50 years, okay? Uh, the idea that, that, that women need health care during pregnancy, that is not a new issue, okay? The idea that teenage girls get pregnant, that's not a new idea either. The idea that most of the people who have abortions are, are women who already have children is not yes. a new idea. So this is one of the oldest, this, this, this is older than the crack in my ass, okay, this, this topic. And they only use it to divide us. That's it. That's all they do. And they're trying to rally the uber uh, white nationalist crowd over this tried and true uh, issue. And then the Supreme Court said, yeah, we'll go down that road with you. We'll do it. We'll give you a little gift here and uh, go ahead and split everybody apart. Also, it was a test. It was a test, Louise. And all of this has been a test. Could they undo the Voting Rights Act? things that people died for, that little girls died in churches for, okay? Could they undo um, affirmative action? And would everybody just lay down for that and buy into the stupid argument that we all have the same beginnings, we all have the same history, and we don't need affirmative action? Would we lay down and say, you could take away a federally guaranteed right to health care all throughout my pregnancy? Would we take that? Don't you see, they're just, they're just taking away one right at a time to test, to see how much we'll take. Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. Okay, you want to know what this is about for uh, sycophants out in the hinterlands that still support Donald Trump, knowing that he's a felon, knowing that he's a criminal, knowing that he attacked his own capital, knowing that he would assassinate his political rival, knowing that he pressured Bill Barr to overturn the results of a free and fair election, and has a Supreme Court that he appointed three justices to, who now say that if he goes to the Justice Department and he demands a political prosecution of somebody that is a political enemy of his, that that's an official act and he can do that why do they do why why are they going down this bad road i'm going to show you right here this is ryan walters ryan walters is the superintendent of oklahoma schools the left they can be offended they can be mad they can be upset but what they can't do is they can't rewrite history we are going to show the countless citations the bible was cited more than any other document in the 1600s 1700s political writings it is clearly a momentous historical source we will bring it back to our schools and look you know we will continue to battle we feel very confident in president trump's nominees to the u.s supreme court mm. that if we can if we get sued and we get challenged uh we will be victorious because the supreme court justices he appointed actually are originalists that look at the constitution <laughs> and not what some left-wing professor said about the constitution so we feel very confident in it moving forward and winning every legal case that's what it's about for them. For them, it's about putting the Bible into the hands of a school teacher in a public school as if she's, I don't know, a, a scholar, a Bible scholar, and making him or her teach a classroom of six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds uh, their idea of what the Bible says as, historical, as a historical document. Once again, they're saying the quiet stuff out loud. And they, he, well, he's doing it. He's yeah, not saying absolutely. it. They, uh, they actually, it. this week, uh, Oklahoma schools uh, made it mandatory that all teachers in public schools must teach the Bible. This is not aspirational anymore. This is actually happening in Oklahoma. Uh, that is the superintendent of schools, and he feels confident that by shoving the Bible down the throats of, uh, you know, kids, some kids may not be uh, Christians, you know, some kids could come from uh, agnostic families, some could come from, I doubt there's any Jews left in Oklahoma, but there could be, uh, but some could be Hindu, some could be, you know, uh, uh, whatever, but he feels like in the 1600s, now I will say the interviewer here pointed out to him 
that the Constitution of the United States, which is what the Supreme Court interprets when they are justifying or negating a law like whether or not there's a separation of church and state, whether or not the public schools funded with public taxpayer money should be teaching any religion at all, let alone his version of religion, okay, that in the Constitution, there is no mention of Christianity at all. And he just downshifts right into the Declaration of Independence as if it was the same document. For the record, the Constitution itself does not mention God or Jesus or Christian in its text. Uh, but going back to your memo, you also say immediate and strict compliance. Immediate and strict compliance is expected. What do you mean immediate? Is every teacher expected to understand how to teach what trained theologians like Dr. King spent their lives trying to interpret? Are you going to have Bible classes for teachers? And what if they don't comply? What happens? Well, first, you made an absurd assumption there, which is the Declaration of Independence that our right came from our creator. That was a distinct uh, change in world history there. And also the separation of church and state appears nowhere in the Declaration of Independence or Constitution. OK, um, she points out the Constitution and he starts citing the Declaration of Independence and he is the super superintendent of schools. OK, I mean, when you when you look at, you know, how schools are doing, Mississippi is 50th, Alabama's 49th, uh, you know, Oklahoma's like what, 44th. Now you understand why. When you can just say that you want to teach accurate American history and it's pointed out to you that the Constitution does not mention Jesus, does not mention Christianity, does not mention God, and he inserts the Declaration of Independence as a stand-in for the Constitution, which is the law. The Declaration is not. The Constitution is. Then you know you're, in, you're up uh, a creek without a paddle, okay? That's why schools do so poorly in places where guys like this lead schools. And how in the world do teachers begin to even wrap their brains around how to teach the Bible? Are we talking New Testament? Are we talking Old Testament? What are we talking? The whole thing? Every, every book? I mean, it's just so, such a bizarre notion that kids can't read or write or they need extra help reading, writing, or they lost a year or two because the past president screwed up so bad on COVID, okay, that kids were, you know, zooming into school if they were lucky enough to have a teacher. And so they're a little behind. And instead of teaching, like, uh, basic life skills, he wants to teach them the Bible. This guy's a zealous fundamentalist disguised as an educator. Yes. And he's gotten the green light from the Supreme Court, and he is hitting the gas. And it's going to be like this all over the country. Yes. Yes, this is terrifying. This is really scary stuff. So y'all continue to cite people who say that, that obviously don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> and what we're going to continue to do is we're going to make sure our kids know history. history. They're going to see citations. They're going to see quotations. They're going to see directly from individuals who said the Bible impacted their decision making. That is in our standards. If teachers don't want to teach it, they are compelled to teach it or they can find another job. They're compelled. The state is compelling teachers to teach a brand of religion. And he's insisting that there is no separation of church and state, except the Establishment Clause says there is. It's unbelievable. It's really, it's, it's unbelievable. It, this is crazy. This is mass man. But this is why they're going along with, hey, let Trump get his beak wet, let him steal, let him create chaos, let him be a tyrant. We don't care. As long as we can teach children uh, the, the, the Bible. The, now, you're going to put the Ten Commandments up on the wall, right? I mean, Alabama's making that mandatory. Um, was Moses um, pre-Jesus in your estimation, or was he post-Jesus now because you want it to be post-Jesus? I, I don't know. Because, you know, if you ask me, uh, Moses was like, you know, way before Christ. Way before. So guess what? You're all Jews now. Speaking of the Jews, uh, what about Jewish <laughs> teachers? What about Hindi teachers? What That's, about saying, an Asian yeah. teacher that believes in Confucianism? They're compelled or they, they could find another job. He told you. <laughs> you asked, he told you. They're compelled. I compel ye. And when he refers to uh, biblical teachings, he, he immediately chooses a century that he likes a lot. And for some weirdo reason, it's the 1600s. 
Now, I would say Jesus was dead in the 1600s for 1600 years. Hence, it's the 1600s. However, slavery did become a thing in the 1600s. Maybe that's why he likes it so much. I'm not real clear. But I find that whole thing that, well, we have to teach the 1600s and the 1700s. Now, in the 1600s, women were being burned at the stake for unlawful carnal knowledge. You know, we've covered this ground a thousand billion times, okay? But he likes that era. He relates to it. Fatality. This is the Randy Rhodes Show. Oh, yes, speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. A president like Donald Trump next year or whoever the president is can take a blatantly illegal act, slap the label, hey, this is an official act, and write that in the preface to whatever the heck he's doing. And now we're going to have to have hearings and so on before district judges and then appeals uh, to determine whether it's truly an official act or not. And it'll all take place against the backdrop of this Supreme Court decision, which says when you pressure, if you're the president and you pressure the Justice Department to throw out or to, uh, to impugn an election results where you obviously have the greatest of personal motives, that's, a pers that's not a personal act, that's an official act. So if that's your standard for what is an official act, much else is going to be official. And what does this mean practically? I think it means if you're Joe Biden, if you're a Democrat who's running for the president, your path right now is clear. You have to run against the Supreme Court. You have to run against this decision. This is not America. If you want to make America great again, you got to return to the rule of law. This decision today, unfortunately, is a blueprint on how to end the rule Are of you law. Are you Seriously, dude, this is this is really not America. It isn't. It doesn't feel right. It feels heartbreaking if you care about America, if you really love this country, if you have any regard for it, even if you like it. You don't have to love it, but you know, if you like it, they're destroying it. Because we are a nation of laws, not men, and that is ancient history. That's what we ought to be teaching the kids. Okay. He wants to. T wants to teach them about witch burning. He wants to teach them about, uh, you know, uh, uh, Hester Prynne. <laughs> he wants to teach them about, for unlawful carnal knowledge, kids, gather round. Look what happened to, you know, uh, uh, Hester Prynne uh, with the scarlet letter. You, you understand what I'm talking about, right? I mean, this, this, this is so un-American. This is so antithetical to the American Revolution, which we're about to celebrate, freedom from the king from the king and the king's church. You know, there was only one religion back then. It was the Anglican church. That was it. That's all you got. No choice. And if you weren't part of it, then, uh, you know, you could go into the Who's Gal. You could go to the Tower of London. You could be tortured. You could be in the uh, Iron Maiden. You know, the Iron Maiden is a thing. I've seen it. Oh, yeah. I went to the Tower of London. The, oh, the, 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 the most amazing devices of torture are in the Tower of London. Tongue pullers where they would pull out the gossip's tongue. <laughs> yeah, good luck, Marge. Uh, and uh, the Iron Maiden, is it, it's, it's like it looks like um, a two-sided coffin. You know, it looks like um, a vessel. And in the vessel are all these spikes on the seat, on the sides, and then they put the person in there on the seat, and then they close it slowly so that the spikes kill you, but slowly. Are they going to bring back drawing and quartering too? I mean, all that's missing. I mean, he actually referred to having gladiator fights this man this week. He actually was talking about having immigrants fight each other for his amusement. When I'm a clown to you, I amuse you. Yes, he wants to do that. He thinks that would be entertaining. It is so Coliseum. My God, man, do you understand how far back they want to take? Humankind? These are some dangerous mofos. Seriously. I, I've just had enough of it, really. I have. I, I, and I'm begging you to look around and say, yeah, you know, this guy's old, but he's decent. And, you know, in the end, being president uh, comes down to character. 
That's what it does. I mean, you want a guy who isn't going to, you know, agitate to break the law and then get the court that he wants by hook or by crook, you know, saying, uh, hold this seat up. Oh, freaking Mitch McConnell. You could blame him all day long for this crap. He freezes too, you know. You've seen it. Mitch McConnell just freezes too. He's still the, uh, you know, the, the, the minority leader in the Senate. Remember what he said? Do you remember what he said? He said he wasn't going to um, remove uh, the, the twice impeached president for the insurrection because the courts could deal with it when he leaves office. President Trump is still liable for everything he did while he was in office as an ordinary citizen. Unless the statute of limitations is run, still liable for everything he did while he's in office. Didn't get away with anything yet. 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 We have a criminal justice system in this country. We have civil litigation. Hmm. And former presidents are not immune from being accountable by either one. Um, Apparently that's not true anymore. Maybe it was back in February of 2021, but it is no longer true. Good God. Brother David. Well, sister, it's here. Yeah. Um, uh, I I don't have to tell you, uh, real quick, yesterday's show was astonishing. Candles continue lighted for Larry. It was so good to hear him call in. Wasn't it? Oh, uh, yeah. Beyond dope. Hi, Larry and so Lake Elsinore. That's we're talking about yes, you. Yeah, we all love you. All the old, the longtime listeners, even if we haven't met each other at meetups, we all have heard each other. Yeah. So it was great to hear him yeah. and everything he said. I second nine thousand percent. So here, here's my last five days. Immediately after the debacle, which, as I said on my post, was significantly better than an abscess tooth. <laughs> I called a, a, a pressured comrade who usually talks me off such ledges. And while they weren't able to do that, they put it in perspective. And then I literally spent the next three days fielding phone calls from as far afield as Galway, Ireland, and Manhattan, and Chicago, and all the places I've been in my activist journey, talking other people off the ledge. Then came Monday's, oh, we're going back to a monarchy decision. Mm -hmm. But Sunday night, the Free State Film Festival, which I worked at the Arts Center, hosted the premiere of something that's going to air on PBS starting July 11th by Oscar-winning co-screenwriter of Black Landsman Kevin Wilmot, called, and write this down, because we're going to want to see it, The Heroic True Life Adventures of Alvin Brooks. Now, Mr. Brooks is a former retired uh, black police captain in an all-white Kansas City district who became police commissioner, has been cited and honored by community activists, et cetera, uh, the John Lewis Moles. And he was there, and he's 92. And while he had to walk a little slow to get out to the seat for the Q&A, and while he would wait five seconds before he formed an answer to the moderator's question, he completely nailed exactly what's going on. And the biggest question that got a standing ovation was when one of the questioners said, with what's going on in the country, are you optimistic? And he said, well, I would say to my lighter-hued brothers and sisters, this is why you look at what's happening where you are in your community and then look to the leaders and the elected that will deal with that and are demonstrating. And he said, because elections matter, and I don't want to name any names, but you got a choice. And you got a standing ovation. That's great. Um, and the choice could not be any clearer. Right. It just could not be any clearer. Well, thank you. Have a happy Fourth of July. I hope well, it's not our last yeah. one. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, since the passing of the partner in 1994 on said date, they've all been ambivalent. But this one, I think, is going to be much more activated for Brother David. Well, and thank you. And you have a happy one as well, Bob. Thank you. Gorgeous girdles for everyone. And not just a few. Love you always. You too. All right. Um, we'll let Biden have the last word. The American people must decide whether Donald Trump's assault on our democracy on January 6th makes him unfit for public office in the highest office in the land. The American people must decide if Trump's embrace of violence to preserve his power is acceptable. Perhaps most importantly, the American people must decide if they want to entrust the president once again, the presidency to Donald Trump, 
now knowing he'll be even more emboldened to do whatever he pleases whenever he wants to do it. You know, at the outset of our nation, it was the character of George Washington, our first president, to find the presidency. He believed power was limited, not absolute. And that power always resides with the people, always. Now, over 200 years later, with today's Supreme Court decision, once again, it will depend on the character of the men and women who hold that presidency that are going to define the limits of the power of the presidency, because the law will no longer do it. I know I will respect the limits of the presidential powers I have for three and a half years, but any president, including Donald Trump, will now be free to ignore the law. I concur with Justice Sotomayor's dissent today. She, here's what she said. She said, in every use of official power, the president is now a king above the law. With fear for our democracy, I dissent, end of quote. So should the American people dissent. I dissent. May God bless you all. May God help preserve our democracy. Happy Fourth.